Hello there everybody, Peter of England. This video has taken quite a few days to uh, put together. It's amazing, sometimes videos just don't seem to want to be birthed. Uh, in between power outages, builders making noises, assassination attempts, and general uh, IT power outages, this one's taken me about five days, so I am very eager to get started. Um, the recap, the slight recap, for people who watch this channel, many of them uh, probably don't realize, because not all of the videos are concentrating on payment methods uh, that were originally founded and part of the doctrinal uh, ideology of We're Bank. Many of these people are watching the, the channel and uh, are not aware of the ancestry that the entire channel was born out of showing you ways to pay off um, with legal and lawful tender debt obligations. Not to become bigger or better consumers, but simply to be able to draw a line in the sand against these adhesion contracts which are perpetrated and put onto you by utility companies, insurance companies, the banks, uh, and uh, the court system, the judicial system, DVLA, passport authorities, whatever it would be, that these, uh, these uh, burdens that are loaded onto you through just normal living um, need to be combated. There's additional taxes, there's VAT, there's every type of machination being loaded onto you that it's possible to put on you. And so just by living, these burdens become increasingly more difficult to handle. So today what I'm going to do is just to give a bit of an overview to the viewers um, of the instruments that Weir Bank has used and has been using for 10 years to successfully, for many people, pay off debt obligations. Now, please be aware that the caveat with all of this is that the individual organizations, public authorities, corporations, government, judiciary courts, etc., who you send these offers of payment to, always have the discretion to refuse. The refusal, though, is in part only a, um, a shadow boxing event. Lawfully or legally, they are entitled to, or should be entitled, to accept them and to clear that debt. If you, though, fold immediately with the idea, oh, they sent it back, it doesn't work, and, uh, and, then, and leave it at that, then it doesn't work. Um, some people, though, are fortunate and these instruments work time and time again quite successfully. So, it's a state of mind and this is what we are about um, generally getting you to absorb that often it's a state of mind and an intention here of the, the creative dynamic within society that enables you to get these bills paid. And one of the things I'm going to look at today is uh, an example of bills that need to be paid that have become almost increasingly and excruciatingly um, high or almost unpayable. What I'm going to touch on though first as everybody can see up here three different techniques and though there are others um, within the, uh, the Weir Bank stable of payment uh, facilities I'm going to cover uh, first the one in the middle, something called acceptance for value, or what is an acceptance for value? An acceptance for value is typically a bill that is sent to you that does not have a pre-existing contractual agreement. That could be, for example, parking I, sending you a bill or um, a, a notice that they are fining you for parking on Morrison's car park. It could be a traffic violation, it could be a speed camera event, it could be utility bill, um, and it could be council tax. So those are the type of things that acceptance for value is looking at. If it's a pre-existing contract, if it's something that you have supposedly read and signed and agreed to, then this isn't for that, though in, in certain circumstances it can be used for that. So, 
in effect, lets you look at the utility bill and the, um, the council tax bill that arrives on your doorstep, um, which would be perfectly uh, feasible to be, um, should we say, um, abjugated or negated with acceptance for value. So acceptance for value is something that helps you to, uh, to send the supposed um, receipt or bill back to the individual who sent it to you, that individual being an organization, um, because what in effect has happened is that is issued for value or issued to obtain value. In and of itself, that bill, that council tax bill or that utility bill has no value whatsoever. It's something that's fishing to get value. So what it's looking for is someone, something out there, it doesn't matter who, to pay it. Okay, so um, in and of itself, it's a valueless, but what happens now is if you put on to it, and usually I would suggest to do this in red pen, corner, uh, or, or diagonally across that utility bill, ready to send it back, accepted for value, transferred for value, it's exempt from levy, you put the date, you put the signature, your signature on that, and there are one or two other things that go on it as well. Um, typically, it would be sent uh, for um, ch charge, uh, uh, sorry, um, deposit with HM Treasury or the, um, the Treasury Department in the United States. And then it would be and charge the same to whoever the county council would be or the electricity company would be. So I'm only mentioning this because it falls under UCC 3104 and also you want to look at the Bills of Exchange Act, 1882, Section 29. It'll give you some idea. So what we're in to and always have been is empowering you through the, the trust funds, which are all, uh, I would say, in effect, absorbed or wrapped within something called a consolidated fund. Um, that have typically and historically been the profits or the cream off the top of the milk that the elite um, use as the, their ways of funding whatever it is they, they want in, in life. So that being said, we've got the A for V and now what we'll look at now is um, these, these drafts as I've called them, the paymaster drafts. They come under the idea or auspices of something called Good Samaritan. As you can see, they come in a quite snazzy little folder. And as an example, I will show these two, two examples. Depending on where they're going in the world, we have this written on the front and on the back stated thus. So primarily, if they're in the European theater of operations, they're going to the Bank of England and to the Bank for International Settlements, one of the most criminal organizations that ever had the dishonor to be incorporated on the planet. Uh, prior to Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944, um, the Norwegians and I think the Swiss wanted an assurity that the Bank for International Settlements would be disbanded. Assurances were given, but after the war, lo and behold, it crept its ugly head back into uh, uh, onto the world stage. Um, if it's in the American theater or Canada, well, not so much Canada, but United States, so-called corporation, South America, um, then it would be going via the International Monetary Fund and the Bank of England. But typically what these are are ideas for you to benefit from. And these were created as a stopgap measure for you to show that it is possible to access your Sestui KV um, trust under the Sestui KV Act 1666, Section 4, for a reclamation of property. So 
There is more on the We Are Bank website, which I suggest you go to. Uh, link will be down as it is with all my YouTube videos. www.wearebank, W-E-R-E, bank.co.uk. And there's more information there. Uh, for those people who um, are in the UK and we can't do it for anywhere else, we're looking at the Citibank HMRC offering. So these are proof positive, absolute proof positive that a security interest was founded the moment that a birth certificate came into being. The moment that birth certificate came online is proof that there was some type of property that had been transferred. And it doesn't matter who transferred it as long as there was property. So no one could claim in any way, shape or form that the certification isn't property. Of course it is. It's a three-dimensional uh, living um, document. So once that came into being, then there were other anomalies that came from it. And what that then led to at the age of uh, 16 or just under, I think nine months before your 16th birthday, you're allowed to apply for a national insurance number, which is what's called a pass-through trust. So from that point of view, when you were now, um, as a rite of passage, allowed to be part of society now and work for a living as a, as a well-functioning, rounded slave, now what you have is another um, trust that is created on the back of the birth certificate trust. So that's the important thing to know that what these, and I'll show you an example of one of them now, what these are, are typically are looking like that. Um, they will have your name on, they will have a, a sort code, they have an IBAN number, a BIC number, a CHAPS number, and prevalent uh, at the moment seems to be post office is very, very uh, uh, amenable to, to having these uh, sorted through there. Seems to be as a different clearing system. So that being said, um, these are the main tools that we've used. There is something uh, that many people might not have understood totally, and that was something called lawful and legal tender. These were the original checks from Weirbank. Um, they were backed by a promissory note. The entire rationale behind this, and this is something now I really think you should pay attention to for all those people out there who think, well, how do we actually uh, counter the argument by um, so-called creditors that they won't accept the offering because it's not legal tender or it's not a banknote from the Bank of England? What you have to realize is that the LLTs uh, were always backed by promissory note. So, just like with the Bank of England, um, there are a few tricks here and a few distractions that have led most of the planet to start charging around, thinking, distracted totally, that it is the, the pound note or the dollar note that is the actual payment. It no longer is the case. And for all the people who are members of We're Bank, there is a little pamphlet that we send to you if requested, or you're having difficulty. And what's uh, the promissory note? Yeah, by the way, the promissory note is on the website. You can actually look at wearebank.co.uk and see an example of the promissory note that backs up the LLT. Um, so what we've, what we've uh, got to look at is the, the, the nature of tender of payment. Okay, because that is a critical scenario for tendering. So, tender, is it a noun, is it a verb, is it an adjective? Well, it can be all three, and it's the tender, it's actually the physical offering. It's the offering here. The offering 
is proof absolutely and anyone who can rebut this in the comments or anywhere else I'm happy for you to try uh, please please mention that or try and make a comment that this isn't so but it's the actual offering it's the tender of the payment the proof of it is simply evidenced by um, the promissory note from the Bank of England, which is either in the form of a £5, £10, £20, uh, same in, in Europe, same with the Euro, same with the American dollar. Um, it is a promissory note. Okay? So the proof here is that when you go to the supermarket and have to pay, then you tender a promissory note. Okay? If that was not the actual payment itself, then you would have to return, maybe, the next day to make good on the note. And as you never have to, it's absolute proof that legal tender note, a promissory note under the Banking Act, um, which gave the Bank of England a total full monopoly, is the only way that you can actually make a payment. There is not enough cash. Actual cash notes as part of the overall obligations, for example, in the United Kingdom, probably these days are not even 1%. You can't actually get cash. So, for example, if you wanted to try and pay off your, um, your car loan, 10,000 or 15,000 pounds, and you insisted in paying in legal tender, it would be very difficult these days for you to actually get hold of, the, hold of that without making some type of uh, appointment or justification. Then when you go to the car dealership, you've got to justify where it came from. So what I'm saying is these organizations behind this, the government, the banks behind the cashless society, the money laundering, um, human trafficking, uh, funding, or whatever they want to try and accuse the little man of, they can't run with the hare and hunt with the hounds. It's either good for both sides or it isn't. And these same individuals that are accusing you, if you've got more than 3,000 in cash on you, that you're, you, you might have got it through some criminal activity, are the same ones who are sending hundreds of billions to Ukraine. They're sending hundreds of billions into Africa. They're sending hundreds of billions around the world for all sorts of nefarious black ops projects. But when they start to turn it towards you, then you can't even squeak without them uh, putting a boot onto you. So this is very important because it's something our mindsets have to adjust to as we are going forward now into very, very turbulent and precarious waters financially. What we've just seen recently with this outage, um, uh, this IT outage worldwide, is many stores or obligations had to be met through the paper product. Um, and so airline tickets had to be written by hand. Cash payments had to be accepted at checkouts, etc. So I don't know whether my theory is it wasn't an accident. It was deliberately done as what's called shock testing. These were protocols adopted in the Second World War uh, by um, British defense organizations and uh, engineering uh, protocols to actually shock test the system to see how it reacted. And don't forget, um, Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum um, had said some time back that um, a blackout, a worldwide blackout, would be a perfect scenario to bring in this, this um, technological reset that he was, he was looking to um, go for, or as a puppet of a puppet master um, go for. So, that's hopefully clarified that the physical tender of these instruments, the physical tender of these instruments is the payment because they've got your signature on them and it's your signature or the signature of the paymaster in the case of the paymaster drafts which monetizes them. That gives the ability for the prepaid account to be accessed and drawn on. Have you ever wondered when you check into a hotel, whether you uh, go to buy a car, open a bank account, why so many signatures are required on the pieces of paper? 
not just one at the end or initial on each page, signature after signature after signature after signature. That's the secret that they don't want you to understand and they will continuously lie and say that there is no, there is no trust fund but we can prove, and it has been proven categorically, that the biggest trust fund in existence, in effect, is this one held by HMRC, UK Treasury, the IRS, the, the Treasury Department in the United States. That is the trust fund of which you are the beneficiary of and which you have the right to access. And as long as you do it and maintain and stick to your guns, that will prove positively successful. So, uh, other things that we've touched on in the past, uh, things that I suggest you, you also look into or look at. Just going to make some room now as we, we pull ahead here. You've got this, UCC 3104. Bills of Exchange Act, 1882. Right. So what I've referred to here is go to the area, area 52, area 52 dot life. Consider joining, and you can make your declaration of divorce there imperative that you begin to do that because as I've referred to in the previous video and I'm, what I'm trying to do is put a bit of a smorgasbord together for you here today. Board being a bit of a pun. Um, I'm putting in a smorgasbord together because it's imperative for those people who want to distance, them, distance themselves from state control and occupation of your mind because as of next year, Mr. Starmer and his European colleagues are going to be assuring you that before you can travel into Europe, you're going to have to apply through what's called the ETIAS system for a visa. A visa to travel, that will be quite a comprehensive document that you'll have to fill in. You'll have to upload biometric data and then to pass through any border in Europe, you will be checked on the border. So if you don't want to submit to that type of thing, I'd suggest you come along through Area 52, you become a member, you start to consider doing this declaration of divorce, uh, use things like Clausula, Rebus, Sextantibus. These you can documents you can find on the removement.net shop. Um, and become an individual as opposed to a person. An individual cannot be divided. In, that means not able to divide into duality. You can't be divided. You are one. And as we are all therefore one, we can all claim individuality as being part of the Godhead or sonship or however you'd like to uh, play that, as opposed to becoming or being called a individual. Yeah, someone that's divided, something that's pieces all over the place. And that's why they like the person. Article 6. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, go and have a look at it. You have an unequivocal right to refuse to be identified as a person. So use the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to support your ability to speak freely, to act freely, to practice your religion, to display in any manner whatever you choose your, your, um, the flag of your country, your religious belief, a crucifix, whatever, Articles 18 to 20, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So whether you are a member of um, uh, Tony Robinson's crew, whether you are a member of Reform uh, with Nigel Farage as a leadership uh, uh, avatar, then what I would suggest is that you all start to look at that. Use that modal law to protect yourself. 
when the police stop you or try to say to you they are arresting you because of this, this, and that. It's a violation of either Article 6, because you're not a person, therefore you're not subject to arrest. Use this as your defence in court. Equally, 18 to 20, uh, under 18 to 20 articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, give you all your abilities to express yourself, your religion, express whatever you want in society, free speech and the likes. You cannot be hindered or stopped. And there's also the right to travel freely across borders. Okay? If you don't invoke this stuff, they will take it from you as if it doesn't exist. So this is why these videos that I'm putting together are so important because you need to know these things and, uh, and so there you go. Right, so this next one, uh, I'm going to try and keep it relatively short because I think I've been speaking now for uh, probably 20, 25 minutes. Um, and I know from the analytics, most people can't watch for more than three or four. Uh, but nevertheless, as I'm on a bit of a flow, here we go. Uh, using or utilizing these things here to pay this here, just as an example. It could be electricity bill, it could be a water bill, it could be gas, it could be any utility that you consume, and it could be council tax. But primarily what we have here is one of the biggest scams that's been perpetrated in the last 20 years. Most of you out there and many of the friends you have have all followed for the hoax of the CO2 problem, climate change, global warming, net zero, the ULES cameras and the rest of the bullshit. Um, one of the biggest cons that you have fallen for um, is the idea that you need electric vehicles and this green, this green energy revolution is doing anyone any good. And it isn't because it's doing no one any good because today's culprit that we're going to examine in some detail. Let me know when you've guessed what this is. There might be some bolts down there. This is a sort of a structure. And what I'm going to do now is... What is that? Is that like a spike coming out of somebody's head? No, you'll get it now. That's it. Wind turbine energy, the biggest con perpetrated on you. I'll give you a quick review because this has come from a whistleblower in the United, sorry, in Australia. Uh, and what I did is I've been f four or five days looking into it, doing some research on it. But in a nutshell, none of this works. None of it. Okay. So, for example, we'll use the UK as the example here, going, going through, giving you some idea. Um, in the United Kingdom, there's approximately 8,650 8, of these things on land. There's about 2,6500 of them offshore. The cost of one of these little on-land beauties are between two and four million each. These ones, offshore, these little babies, these come in at between 10 and 12 million. For example, the GE, that's General Electric, Halley, Halleydale, uh, X12 megawatt one comes in at around about 13 million. So this is what we've, we've got here and why your electricity bills are killing you because under something called renewable energy legislation, in the UK it was the Energy Act, 
2023, all of this is subsidy legislation. Okay, so these are all being paid for by subsidies. And for one of these here, the on-land units, around about 500,000 per annum gets paid to the electricity organization that puts them up. For these offshore ones, comes in at around about two million. So, combining these together, if we take an average here of three, uh, if we take the average on here, what we come in with here, um, just quickly looking at the, my notes here, I think that comes in at around, yeah, comes in at about 9.6 billion a year is going in subsidies to these organizations that put these up. Okay, now the farmer, the farmers, um, we're using the UK as the model here now, the farmers probably get around about seven and a half, could be a little bit more, uh, seven and a half thousand per unit per annum. And what people don't realize here is the following hoax, the farce of all of this is, and I've always actually thought to myself, well, how come, how come these blades are, are, are actually quite small? And it was almost like, you know, oh, well, somebody's just invented the paper clip and it makes you realize straight off, oh, well, that's the reason. These things are turbines and not windmills. So they're not designated to catch the wind. So on a Beaufort scale, um, wind speed, they can only operate probably from Beaufort 1 to probably about Beaufort 4 before they would have to be switched off. Now they have to draw power from the grid. So these things are pulling energy, not delivering energy, from the, say, coal power stations. If they get over a certain wind speed, they have to be switched off, so they're pretty useless, and so most of the time they have to be regulated. And so the gearing on that is all being controlled by a power drain from the power stations, not a plus contrib contribution. So there's anything but green. These things cost a fortune to put together, um, and often they will, or incredibly can, catch fire because of bearings or oil problems within the, the motors. How many times have you seen a wind farm out there? Four or five are going, four or five are not going, it, or operating or turning. So the problem then becomes this. When these are functioning quite well between Beaufort 1 and say the Beaufort scale uh, 4, um, that's, that's fine as long as this wind speed here correlates with a demand at the coal-fired power station for the supply. If it doesn't correspond with the supply at the power station, because they don't have batteries, they've got nowhere to store this. So what they have to do is something called gas off or steam off the incoming so-called green energy that is being delivered by these wind farms. So as you can see, the entire rigmarole here is based on a fraud. So they're laughing up their sleeves at you because there are five companies um, that actually, only five companies, in the UK that put these up and guess what? Not one single one is a Welsh or English company and arguably 
the one that's Scottish is probably, and I haven't done enough digging, owned by some other foreign interest. So what we've got is uh, one called RWE Energy. That's a German company. The next one, we've got one called Orsted. That's Danish. We've got another one called Vattenfall. They are Swedish. Then we've got, I think it's uh, SS, I think it's SSE Renewables. And we've got Scottish Power Renewables, blah, blah, blah. This one is owned by a parent company called Iberdola, and that's Spanish. Leaving just one here, possibly, from Scottish, uh, Scottish Power, um, owned by anything in the UK. So all of this, all of this money, all this, and I haven't included in this 9.6 billion here, um, the setup costs, okay? Uh, typically to put up one of these, these um, creatures, these obstacles, these disgusting blights on the landscape, typically between anything between 30 to 100,000 just for the transport, okay? Uh, erection and installation between 350 to 400,000. Then you've got commissioning and additional costs like that. So with this, it can come to probably another three million on each one for it to be installed, commissioned, and up and running. And don't forget, I would think with a lot of these offshore that they haven't even bothered to run underground cables back to the grid. Uh, I think they're just ornamental. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be controversial at all for them to have pulled the wool over your eyes. So what I'm trying to link all this up here with is this is a, a classic example of a folly. Just like the electric cars, just like the woke agenda, just like your politicians will do a favor or be different than the previous political party. Not the case. You're being duped. Uh, they're laughing up their sleeves at you, and therefore you have a social, moral, legal, uh, spiritual obligation to do something to counter it, don't you think? And what that counter is, is look to use these other instruments to stay in honor, but tender payment to these goons. Because if we want to put um, this in some sort of perspective here, um, they're approximately, I think, I think it's around about 25 million households in the UK. Average electricity bill, probably about 1,000 pounds. So let's keep it simple. We're coming in at about 25 billion revenue coming in and of that I said before here uh, you've got for these things they're costing 9.6 billion without the setup costs each year to pull them through I've put some notes uh, on this one here yeah that's covered that so you've got Quickly. Yeah, you've got around about 38%, but with the setup cost, that can probably easily go to 45 to 
of your escalating year-on-year -year electric bill being required to be paid, that percent within your bill here, being paid just to keep this folly going, which I think is a nonsense. So I think you should be told, I think you should get in touch with Ofgen, I think you should start petitioning to find out why these, these companies here are being allowed to fleece the taxpayer to make staggering profit off electric and siphon it out of the country. And what you'll also find is, if you've looked at the historical graph of electricity prices, you will see from about 1998, when the European Commission decided they wanted to start pushing their green agenda and going more electric friendly, i.e. making you into a bigger clown with a clown's hat on than you already are, as far as they're concerned, what you started to see is price escalation of electric bills in line, lockstep with the putting up of these wind farms because it's you that are paying it directly. So what's happening is it's a circular, vicious circle. To pay for these, they increase your electric bill. Your electric bill gets increased because they want to put these things up. And the people who are putting them up are the Rishi Sunaks, the Starmers, the juiced in members of the elite club that are all going along with this and they think they don't care. They just know you'll keep paying, especially with the electricity bill. So what I'm saying is these instruments here, the paymaster drafts, the acceptance for value as a qualified response, the Citibank, HMRC, the LLT, Weir Bank checkbooks for all those who've still got them. Go upstairs, look out for them, go into the drawer where you put them four or five years ago, dig it out, because we will also probably quite soon be reissuing these because they have a, they have a seniority now which has not been destroyed, hampered, touched, or been able to be combated in the 10 years that we've been using them. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is what I wanted to cover. If I didn't, um, this is stands for, just here, the ETS system, uh, European Travel uh, in something automatic system. Uh, don't know. And this is VIS, stands for Visa Identification Service. Yeah, the European Travel um, uh, Investigative Automatic System or Identity System. So I've covered most of the things. Uh, I will just check I haven't left anything uh, too important out because I made some notes. And as this is a long video running at now around about uh, probably 50 minutes, 45, um, yeah. So one of the, the questions that I asked or posed myself, because I didn't know, why isn't any of this known? Why isn't there an, any investigative journalism based around it? Why are you not told of this? Why are you not told this is how much these units cost? Um, you know, for an offshore one, you're getting two million a year for putting one of these up. It's a cash cow. The more they put up, the more, in effect, they've got just all that these things are, are follies with pound notes or dollar signs dropping off them. Um, so I would really suggest that you, you, know, you try and get your head around it. Um, the people that are putting them up, they don't care. They're getting paid very good money. The engineers that service them, they're looking after them. The service contract alone on one of those is around about between 45 and 48,000 a year per one for someone to go and have a look at it and make sure the oil's top top, etc. So everybody's being juiced in on it. Just like the people who put the ULEZ cameras up, the, the blue collar workers, the people next door to you or down the street, they're creating a prison for their own, their own families and their own friends and for themselves. 
Why are they doing this? Because it's well paid and I've got to keep paying the mortgage. Oh really, what a great idea. The people who will be putting the turnstiles up for the 15 minute cities. The people who will be putting the ramps in place to stop you being able to move or making sure you're locked down. Yeah? Um, and the Nigel Starmers with... Uh, yeah, sorry. Nigel Farages and the Kia Starmers aren't going to change it for you at all. Uh, disappointing news for all of those in the reform group who think Farage is going to be a, um, uh, an, an angel for you. Uh, I think it's just going to be another golden um, tippy-toe down the road for another disappointment. Um, I'll give some comments next time on the Trump uh, assassination folly, uh, because I think many people have totally missed the point. Um, but all in all, that's what I'm um, saying to you here. Um, everybody is missing the point on it, I think. Um, and everyone has to pay this electricity bill. You can't avoid it. It's part of the power network, um, the two main organizations. Really for the, the power, it's the fourth Reich against the Zionist cabal. Fourth Reich is everything to do with the planet other than money um, and the rag trade. Fourth Reich take care of the power side, the military side. The Zionist cabal take care of the money um, and gold, uh, precious metals, diamonds, etc. So the money side of the power grid is here. The functioning of the power grid is here. But it's like the mafia in New York and the mafia in Chicago. They're both doing the same job. So thank you very much for persisting to the end. Take notes. Watch it again. It's very important. Go along to uh, the We Are Bank site, go to removement.net, go to area52.life and join. Uh, come along with us, take these instruments and we'll see um, together how we can defeat with practical weaponry the, 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 the offence that's been delivered onto you and us. Thank you.